who is fondly remembered by many of us from her, pre from her joining us in the symposium last year and from her work around this area, having done extensive work with Planned Parenthood, concentrating on birth control information, she stresses understanding and acceptance of ourselves as sexual human beings. Now associated with the YWCA of Freeport, Illinois, I'm pleased to present to you Sue Coppernall. I am 14 years old. I've been elected secretary of the freshman class at Upper Suburban High. I'm a senior Girl Scout. I'm in regular attendance at St. Ludwig's Lutheran Church School. I've been bawling since I was 12. How do I tell them I'm pregnant? I'm 37 years old. I've been married 20 years. I have a part-time job at a gift shop, and I go to League of Women Voters twice a week in the morning. Our family is very open. My son is 16. My daughter is 14. They know that my husband, their father, had a vasectomy three years ago. How can I tell them I'm pregnant? I am 17 years old. My mother and I have lived alone since I was born. Two years ago, my mother's lover came to live with us. I have been having intercourse with my mother's lover for six months. How do I tell them I'm pregnant? I am 23 years old. I've just received my CPA and the title of partner on my firm's letterhead. I am the only woman in the firm. I have never been, nor I, do I intend to be, married. How do I tell them I'm pregnant? I am 15 years old. My brother and I had intercourse three times last summer when we were alone at the family cabin. How do I tell them I'm pregnant? I am 25 years old. I'm a part of a group marriage of three couples. We have decided on open sexuality, and we've agreed that our community is not ready for children. How do I tell them I'm pregnant? The answer to the first question raised by my presentation is, of course, gently, very gently. Since that's the only answer that I will propose, and I have lots more questions, let us proceed. Why must we leave so much communicating about our sexuality to the media, to the Human Sexuality Symposium, to the printed word, the organized discussion, or encounter group? Why do we give each other books but never feel comfortable talking about the books each of us could write? Last March at the Y here in Ames, I heard a group of women discuss taboos that had been handed down to them early in their lives, messages given verbally to female children by their mothers concerning the human body. Keep your legs together, put your dress down, young ladies don't sit that way, wash down there last. Did you sleep without your panties again, naughty girl, shame, shame. Most of us have begun to discard such communications and warnings. Still, I see strained silence and waiting for some messiah, an expert, as our major ways of dealing with reach back and afterburn from our own experiences. So much of what we learn in this age of instant enlightenment is garbled, all messed up, incomplete, and sometimes destructive. Consider the young man who thought he was abnormal at the age of 27 because he had learned, he told me seriously, while attending a short course in agriculture at Iowa State University that he was supposed to ejaculate only every 28 days. And the housewife who told me she used lard as a contraceptive to make the sperm bounce off the egg so that implantation could not take place or the 20-year-old mother of two children who was surprised when she learned that she would have eventually had her menstrual periods, even without benefit of opening by intercourse, from a next-door neighbor when she was 11. We have decided what not 
to tell our children and each other what negative attitudes we will not hand on to our students or transmit as honored family traditions. We've decided what disclosures we will not make to our lover or our spouse. We are in conflict about what we shall say. We cannot decide just how far one can safely go in honesty and openness. One result is plain old confusion. Another is divorce. Another, disowning one's son or daughter. Always and inevitably, a major result of being unable to communicate our, about our sexuality is fear, mistrust of ourselves and others, and a, per a pervasive anxiety which blocks our capacity for intimacy. Talking about sex is a sexual activity. The Reverend Mr. Billy Graham, in his tirades against woman's and man's sexual nature, is engaging in a distinctly sexual pastime. For Mr. Graham, this communicating about sexuality has become a harmful, guilt-ridden, and guilt-inducing ritual. Talking about sex is, for many people, a healthy, happy activity. For others, a way of fantasizing. When I was in family planning, I was often amused by the permission that birth control specialists were able to give themselves to talk about sexuality, other people's. I have been delighted with the titles of the presentations at this seminar. Sex is too often, and should not be, a matter of dull and plodding seriousness or intense and scarified discussion. A few years ago, in our clinic, we were sent a birth control manual with the playful title, How to Make Love, Not Babies. A few months later, the title was changed, and a memo advised that this had been done in the interests of being taken seriously and not offending. The new title was The Egg and Sperm Handbook. About six months ago, I read in the Chicago Tribune Review the account of Northwestern University's Human Sexuality Seminar. The reviewer described sober faces and laborious scholasticism on the part of seminar participants. The headline read, Sex is ho-hum at Northwestern. I have a personal interest in seeing that sex not always be merely ho-hum. Talking about our shared human characteristic, sexuality, can be a good thing, an interesting thing, a painful process, a funny ha-ha or a funny peculiar process, or a joyful one. Not talking about it is a luxury we can no longer afford. We cannot allow the media, the self-styled experts, the back alley furtive conference, scholarly treatises and tracts, coffee clutch war stories, or pious diatribes by sex-fearing sermonizers to be our only avenues of ventilation about the humanness of our sexual lives. We must learn to talk to each other. Perhaps we could begin by less communicating with a capital C and start taking the risk of talking about our own and other sexuality openly and honestly. Yes, Mary Jane, your mother does enjoy sexual intercourse even though she went through the menopause back when you were in high school. That is, she does now, if she ever did then. Yes, Harold, your father may have an occasional inappropriate erection upon being faced with powerful sexual stimuli. Has he walked across ISU's campus with you in spring? No, all you home economists in training. The choice of PE as a major and coaching as a vocation does not mean your roommate is necessarily a lesbian, latent, or otherwise. Have you asked her what her sexual preferences are? Are you willing to reciprocate in openness and honesty? Yes, Jerry, it is possible that the miscarriage your family has whispered about for years, ever since 1939, was in fact a self-induced abortion. 
We have not in the 1970s invented all the procedures and techniques for aborting a fetus, nor have women only recently encountered the life situations which make access to abortion imperative for women who request termination of pregnancy. So how, you're asking me, how do we talk about such things? And VD, and the first time I masturbated, and the fact that I'm scared my cat turns me on, and the weird feeling I had when I saw my parents' marriage license and my birth certificate and found out that I was born five months earlier than expected after all those no-nos they've been handing me. How do I let my father know I'm, that I know that he's having an affair and it's okay with me? Or how do I say, I found out about that slut and I'm gonna bash your head in for mother's sake? Or are there other things we can and should be saying before crisis, during experience, and in the meantime, until the Messiah comes. I submit that there are. When children ask us questions, we can give them answers, the best answers we can find. We can be honest with our children in telling them that our answers may at some time in the future be subject to change that they have certainly been evolutionary in their formation and are, at best, tentative. Nobody's marriage is as closed today as it was yesterday, and nobody's family is as traditional this year as it was last year. We have met the future, and it is now. We no longer sit restlessly in small group discussions pondering how we are to be on the cutting edge of society. Each of us has met, in her or his own life, individual cutting edges of reality. More and more often, these edges come in clumps and crowd us into corners. An edge which is not to be avoided, which will be dealt with by all of us, is that dilemma surrounding human relationships as expressed in marriage and the family. We are individually and collectively deciding what it is to be human. In order to facilitate honesty and openness, we must build structures which will allow for a new family, the open family, groups of people who choose to love each other. These groups are in some instances made up of people who share biological relatedness. In other instances, the groups are made up of persons whose caring for and commitment to each other is matched by the diversity of individuals whose decision it is to become related. Shades of color, age differences, varying sexual orientations, and a range of cultural origins are often characteristics of the open family. A part of the process of opening marriage in the family, of opening relationships, has been the shrinking of our world into a global village. We are beginning to take seriously what that grand old lady Margaret Mead has been telling us for 40 years. Our own little world, whether WASP or Watts, is not the only one. Until recently, we perpetuated the myth that the only sexual act in which Americans engaged birth to death was face-to-face -face intercourse by two persons, one female on bottom, the other male on top, both of whom were white, over 21, and married to each other. As segments of the intellectual and scientific community begin the necessary shift from gazing always outward and seriously pursue the exploration of inner space a new and growing field for scholars is the examination of the facts rather than the myths of sexual behavior throughout American history. Young people in colonial America engaged in sexual intercourse without benefit of clergy pronouncements or legal sanctions. Evidence of such activity is found in a study of the baptismal records of one of the first Protestant churches in the New World one frequented by the originators and owners of that highly touted rule by which each of us supposedly lives, the Puritan ethic. 
Exactly 50% of all children baptized there were born five to seven months after their parents' weddings, a statistic shared by children born in the state of Iowa in 1968. We can no longer deny the reality of human experience by pretending that ideals of chastity, fidelity, and the nuclear family structure have in fact been the dominant codes by which we have acted out our sexual lives. Mamas and papas do not get married and live happily ever after, as evidenced by our divorce rates, which are increasing more rapidly in the years immediately before, during, and after the 25th wedding anniversary than for persons in any other age group. Mama does not always love papa. Sometimes she loves the woman who is her bridge partner or the leader of her encounter group and to satisfy society's norms, marries papa for cover. Being pregnant does not always mean you are a naturally loving, accepting mother or that you will automatically take care of a child once you have given birth, as evidenced both by the incidence of abortion on demand and by court dockets crowded with child abuse cases. Very few people in today's world live out adult lives of 60 to 70 years with one sexual partner. Women and men in the final decades of their lives are defying God, convention, and the Social Security Administration by leaving those burial grounds of our society, senior citizens' rest homes, whether the indigent's county old folks home or the retired stockbroker's Sun City. They are living together in group relationships which include active sex lives into their 70s, 80s, and 90s. Women and men for whom sexual fulfillment is found with persons of their own sex are asserting their right to live productive lives outside closets and cliches. Gay liberation is no longer a fringe element confined to Berkeley or Washington Square. There are chapters of organizations such as Gay Alliance forming in high schools all over America with resulting consternation on the part of parents and administrators. In the midst of chaos and confusion, patterns are emerging which reaffirm the goodness of being a part of a family, a group of people who choose to love each other. The dire difficulties we are experiencing lie in two areas, that of undoing and that of restructuring for openness and growth. Most of the undoing is long overdue of elementary importance and is being attempted in mistaken ways. When I take a film called Parent to Child About Sex to a group of young mothers and common alarm is expressed that parental acceptance of childhood exploration of the genitals will, in their words, make little boys queer, I am saddened. When at a YWCA coffee, a mother in her mid-30s tells her peers that discussion of sexuality is a normal part of her family's dinner table talk, and that then goes on to declare in a voice filled with tension from an agitated body that her daughter will never need an abortion because she has been taught self-control, I want to cry. When a young wife, age 23, experiences delight in preliminary lovemaking, yet freezes and experiences panic upon recalling her mother's repeated instructions during her adolescence, never let a man touch you below the waist, I'm depressed. When a young woman, 17, tells me that her parents were very good to her when she became pregnant, that they neither panicked nor scolded, that they merely said, you got yourself into this mess, now get yourself out, and have not yet, 18 months later, discussed in any way the fact that their daughter obviously did not bear a child. I am appalled. When my hairdresser, who is male, encourages me to accompany he and his wife to a swinging party and tells me that his purpose in wife swapping with casual strangers is to ensure that he will never have to fear losing his wife because she will not form a loving relationship with any of the strangers, I am curious, but unconvinced that protecting one's mate from a loving relationship is a worthy life goal. When a school administrator constructs on paper 
an excellent curriculum for sex education, then issues a memorandum forbidding the implementation of that curriculum in the classroom, then proudly shows the manual to an examiner from the Board of Public Instruction, I am enraged. When a 27-year-old male graduate student has lived with three women in five years and affirms the goodness in separate ways of each of these relationships, yet bitterly denounces his father for remarrying a few months after his mother's death, I'm dismayed. When 13-year-old women in junior high school have already classified most of their peers as good girls or sluts, I shudder for their own and their sister's worldview and all that it means in terms of self-acceptance and the future of relationships between the sexes. To my sisters in the women's liberation movement, you indeed have here a lot of undoing. When words like screw and fuck are used to describe sexual functioning and pig, nigger, fag, dyke, and gook are used to describe human beings in everyday conversation, while penis and vagina on one hand and love and respect on the other are dirty words at best and seldom used at work, dirty words at worst and seldom used at best, I am bewildered. Both the undoing of harmful, destructive ways of being in relationship and the restructuring of these relationships must take place in all areas of human life. The need exists wherever there are struggling persons in whatever circumstance. The process cannot be delayed. We must begin. A closed family means closed communications systems. In my own experience, the decision to venture into opening marriage in our family has proved to be for us a good one. What is open marriage? Is it a system invented by the O'Neills that's easy to follow like a cookbook? Hardly. Open marriage is neither new with the publication of a book, nor is it foolproof. Full proof. Is open marriage then a prescription for sexual license? Hardly. The agreed-upon sexual codes of persons in open marriage vary as widely as in other marriages, as widely as do the individuals involved. Is open marriage, in fact, non-marriage? Advocacy of abolition of legal governances of marriage, divorce, child custody? Hardly. Open marriages that work reinforce and strengthen family and kinship ties and have the added advantage of expanding these ties into a community of persons who choose to love each other. In an open marriage, there are two people or more who really dig each other and who have enough going for them at times when it is most needed to want to preserve the primariness of the relationship without limiting and ultimately destroying the personhood, integrity, joy, and worth of either of the partners. The open family is one in which the same acceptance and support of individual growth needs is extended to young persons in the family. A great risk is taken, that of both parents and children deciding to disclose themselves to each other as they are, in weakness and in need, in strength and in glory, in full humanity. Our open family is one in which mother flies off to Denver or Cleveland. The family doesn't stop functioning because of her absences. Meals are cooked by whomever is home at mealtime, whether she or he is 13 or 45. The workings of those complicated little buttons on the washer and dryer have been mastered by all members of the family, regardless of sex or age, as have the intricacies of buying groceries and balancing the checkbook. Mother can take a month off to embroider a tablecloth while daughter applies for law school. Father can switch vocations after 20 years, knowing that he not only has emotional support from his family, but that mom and the kids will go to work if his income is temporarily lowered or even non-existent. All members of the family, parents and offspring, are free to develop close relationships with persons of the same or opposite sex without concern or censure. Sweetness and light, I hasten to assure you, are not always, or even often, a good description of the atmosphere surrounding our home. We are gutsy, attempting honesty people who give each other hell 
as well as love and affection. An open family is one in which the decision has been made to confront life and each other by pushing the potential for growth to whatever point we have come to understand at a given moment in time. An open family is one in which decisions are not made for persons, but with persons. Just before Christmas this year, we sat on the floor holding hands with a young friend who told of us of his three-year effort to extricate himself from the father's son plans for the son's career. Acceptance from dad's alma mater had arrived in the mail before the son ever made application. On that day, the son was told, an engineer doesn't have much time to write poems, son, so you may as well put them away and forget about them. Perhaps the way in which our family is most open is in that way we have of never quite knowing what the current population of our house may be. People of all sizes, shapes, and mindsets, from foster children to senior citizens, are constantly coming and going. I'll never forget one of the first precedent-shattering consequences of this open-door policy. Dad and Mom came home after midnight several years ago to find a note on the kitchen counter which read, Dear parents, the girl in my bed is my guest. Love, Doug. Since eldest son was at that time just past 14, I must say dear Mom and Dad were more than a little relieved to find Doug on the sofa in the family room and the girl who was his guest upstairs in his bed alone. An open family is one in which first sexual explorations of young people take place neither in the back seat of a car at a drive-in movie theater, nor in hurried secrecy while one's parents are out. Privacy, respect, and the acceptance of the sexual awareness and needs of adolescents are given, as they are to the sexual nature of the parents. Children, as well as parents, must take responsibility for the openness that will lead to changes in dealing with and communicating about sexuality. Last summer, a friend received a letter saying, from her son, saying that the son, his roommate, and both their girlfriends would be spending the first week in June at her house on their way from college in Iowa to summer jobs in Colorado. The close of the first evening at home my friend invited her son's roommate and his girl to use the guest room. Since, said she, in, attempt, in an attempt to be with it, I know that you share the apartment at school most of the time. Then she turned to her son, assigned him to his childhood room upstairs, took her son's girl into the den, made up a bed, and kissed the girl goodnight fondly. This scene really took place and was really a farce. The son's girl knew that the son knew that his mother knew that they had been sleeping together for months. Yet everybody was caught in an awkward, humiliating game. The young woman was responsible because she had allowed herself to be moved back into the dormitory every time Mama came to the university. The young man was responsible because he had asked such deception of her. And Mama was responsible because she had participated in the game. If there are to be breakthroughs in the direction of honesty here, all three persons will have to be responsible for breaking the cycle of pretense. An open family is one in which a Lance Loud would not have to run away to a gay ghetto in order to be himself. Merle Miller, former editor of Harper's and homosexual, tells in his book On Being Different of receiving a letter, one of hundreds from married men. I quote from the letter, I have been married for more than 20 years, have a daughter who is 20 and in college, another who is 18 will start college in the fall. We have a beautiful home and I feel a good life together. For me, the thrills, excitements, and beauties of sex have always come from men. I would like to open the door and have gay friends to my house and have the knowledge accepted. Has this ever been done successfully? If so, how? How can you change a person's mind when homosexual is a very dirty word, even though they've lived with you 20 years lovingly? While homosexuals are coming out of their closets, families are coming out of Victorian stereotypes. Women are coming out of their slavery to society. 
Suburbanites, suburbanites are coming out of their split-level traps. Women and men of color are coming out of bondage. Students are stepping out of the role of nigger, played to academies massa. And children are no longer playing dumb. How are we to facilitate human relationships that will allow for these freedoms? Last week, I was told by a young divorced mother that she was sexually frustrated because she hated to go to men's apartments, have to get dressed and go home. So what was she supposed to do? Have sex in her own apartment with her five-year-old son in the next room? I dare say if that young woman had worked through and was accepting of herself, her values and needs, and her own sexuality, her son would feel good about his mother's sexual relationships. The double standard so deplored by women has its counterparts scattered throughout many facets of our society. A young graduate student told me of his father's dictum that the son was not to have sexual intercourse as long as father was paying the bills. That means, the young man said, that from the time I was 14 until I'm 25, I'm supp supposed and expected to deny my physical needs as well as my psychic needs for warmth and closeness which for me accompany good sexual relationships. I wonder what my father would say if I demanded and could ensure that he spend the next 11 years of his life in total abstinence. After apparently figuring things out so well, the same young man later astounded me by threatening never to see his father again upon accidentally bumping into his father in a restaurant, obviously enjoying the company of an attractive young woman who was not mom. Somehow, and I feel that there are hows, we must stop seeing people as things, roles, histories, categories, classifications, labels, or levels of hierarchies, and see them as persons. Though I have not as yet needed parents without partners, I have often wished for a button that read, parents are persons. In declaring independence and the need for acceptance, young people must allow their parents the same options. An unmarried female professor at a university came to my office a few years ago for abortion counseling and referral. One of the young woman's dilemmas was whether or not she would decide to share her decision to abort and the entire experience, which turned out to be a positive one, with her mother. Three months later, she told me, with tears of wonder in her eyes, that her decision to let her mother be a part of those weeks had not only been a good thing, but that her mother had needed, in a very special way, to share in the daughter's experience. It seems that during the Depression years, her mother had taken the risk of self-inducing an abortion because she did not have enough food to feed the children she'd already born. For over 35 years, the older woman had kept her secret hidden, fearing that even her husband would not understand. How do we begin to open families? One place to begin is to talk to each other. Another good starting place is for each of us to take risks with self-disclosure. A third place, long overdue all over the place, is an acceptance that different people in different times and stages of growth have varying sexual needs that are neither good nor bad in themselves, but are what we make of them. A recent article written by Alex Comfort, author of The Joy of Sex, was published in a magazine of the Center for the Study of Democratic Institutions. The article entitled Sexuality in a Zero Growth Society states that contraception has for the first time wholly separated the three human uses of sex. Sex as parenthood, sex as total intimacy between people or relational sex, and sex as physical play, recreational sex. Comfort, a fellow of the center, says that in the zero population growth world, we are all clan brothers and we'll have to find ways of expressing the ideal of universal kinship. If we pass the test, he feels, we may evolve into a universal human family in which all three types of sex have their place, in which all but the most unrealistic inner needs can be met 
in one form or another. Casualties of this process, becoming a universal human family, will have to be changes toward an anxiety about bisexuality. We are coming to understand that many of us, perhaps most, have the capacity for sexual expression with persons of either sex. Physiologically, we are neuter with the potential for becoming male or female until late in the third month of fetal development. Young children openly express affection, curiosity, and exploration of each other without regard to gender. Orgasm can be achieved by manual stimulation by persons of both sexes without regard for the maleness or femaleness of the hand initiating the stimulation, and it would take a dedicated chauvinist indeed to ascribe gender to a vibrator. I have said most of us have the capacity for bisexuality, not the willingness, or the desire, or even the desirability. As sex roles and divisions blur and blend, bisexuality will increasingly become an option. Last spring, Joan Baez recounted the story of her love relationship with a woman 10 years ago. One of the most beautiful experiences of my life, she said, and went on to say that since that time, she has been male-oriented and heterosexual. The awareness is there. What we do with it, as with all awarenesses and relationships, is a decisional matter about which we can be intentional and for which we need not accept any guidelines which are not our own. Another important casualty in the open society is likely to be sexual jealousy. In their book, Open Marriage, the O'Neills came to the conclusion that jealousy is a learned response built into us by the fears and cautions of successive generations, and it need not be a factor which would limit the development of relationships in or out of marriage. Carl Rogers, in his book, Becoming Partners, Marriage and Its Alternatives, comes to an entirely different conclusion. He has belatedly, but firmly, arrived at the position that jealousy is somehow inherent in our species. It is such an overwhelming emotion that it cannot be undone, he says, and for this reason is leery of attempts to overcome or work around or through jealous feelings. I do not know whether we are born with it or are inculcated with feelings that we should be jealous by our culture. I do know that jealousy is painful and destructive and that we are not handling it very well in our attempts at open relationships. I would add to the casualty list the things that have got to go if we are to have an open society, the spirit of unending competition bred into us by our jococratic society. Competition between the sexes, between mates and siblings, between scholars, governments, and races. The lifestyles to be lived out by those of us who are in this room have yet to be imagined. Some of us will enter into traditional, closed, male-dominated marriages some of us will become part of the divorce statistics. Others will opt for open marriages. Some of us will withdraw entirely into collectives made up of women out of a need to retreat from the pressures and the hurts of trying to make it in a man's world and getting messed over by our brothers. Some of us will establish group or multilateral marriages. Others will attempt to have homosexual marriage for both sexes institutionalized. Some of us will successfully establish homes that are single-parented. Others will live in groups of adults who decide never to include bearing and rearing of children as a part of the life experience. This multiplicity of options I see as a good thing. The struggle to move toward loving relationships in all areas, areas of human life is one in which we are all engaged taking a long, hard look at where we have been, where we are now, and the directions in which we are moving, and then talking about it with each other is an imperative we can no longer put aside. Acceptance of ourselves and others is a prerequisite to forming open, honest, and loving relationships. A determination to be ourselves not to cop out into roles predetermined for us 
is a necessity. The courage to dare, to risk, to talk about it and then get on with it in the face of whatever comes must follow. We can write new scripts. We need not ride perilously on the swing of a pendulum from freedom to repression and back again. Within each of us is the as yet largely untapped capacity for intimacy that can replace the harmful ways in which we have structured and perpetuated families in the past. This capacity for intimacy can lead us to the family of the future, a group of people who choose to love each other. Thank you, Sue. If you'll pass your cards to the center, we'll start questions. Does anybody have a burning question right off that we could? Okay. I, I know what you're talking about, and I do see a need for that kind of movement. I think that we're going to be uh, faced much more strongly than any of us who support the right for abortion with an infringement of our liberties. I think that uh, this movement toward a constitutional amendment, which will make abortion illegal for anyone ever under any circumstances, does have a lot of money and power behind it. And I think we, you know, those of us who are concerned can be um, active politically in this way. Um, and I'm sure that there are other areas. It's, it's kind of like back in the days of the Civil Rights Movement when um, the black um, people were asking for their rights and some of the Jewish people wouldn't back them up because they didn't want to be identified with that sort of thing. You know, I think those of us who are trying and perhaps have found some ways to live out our lives and really don't care if um, gay liberation people get put in jail or if, if um, you know, if, some, if somebody's liberties are being really stomped on and we don't find a way to say that that's important to us too. An example of this, uh, I was just talking to someone who's in family planning. Down in the state of Missouri, all legal restrictions for contraceptives for minors have been removed. The legislature made it uh, legal for anyone of any age to go to a doctor for VD and birth control. And yet over half of the family planning clinics down there are either not providing these services or are hassling about it because they say they don't want the kids in their clinics or, you know, that that's not something that they should get involved with the community image. So, yeah, there are a lot of things that we need to become Okay, and then we get into the, the kind of um, thing that, that Rimmer was talking about last year of his feeling that his way of structuring legalized Proposition 31 marriage was the only way for group marriages to exist. So, I, you know, I don't, I don't see that new laws, I, I'm, I'm talking about being aware of when res restrictive ones are going to be placed and then caring enough to stand up and say, you know, I, I care about my brother or my sister, don't do that.
Okay, given the fact that you accept open sexuality in an open family, how do you relate or deal with parental figures who are non-accepting of this lifestyle and threatened by it, especially if you are a minor? Well, I'm not a minor. I haven't been for years and years and years and years. Um, our family got into this recently. Our son is being married on Saturday of this week, right after we leave here. And some of his friends had um, sort of a farewell for he and the girl he's going to be marrying. The next door neighbor in our neighborhood came up to the people who were coming into the party at our house and said, what's going on over there tonight? And they said, we're going to a party for Jeff and Susan. And the neighbor said, "Is he's, he, Jeff's getting married. And the neighbor said, is that the girl he's been living with? Um, you know, we were not, not only not aware that that was none of the neighbor's business, but we were not aware that it was their concern. It was not something that we had decided. Okay, I've talked to some people about this kind of thing, and there's a concept in my mind about not hanging your own scarlet letter on your own back. You know what society used to do with the woman who was pregnant? The old A on the back. And we have to be very, very clear about our own motives, about what are we doing when we're confronting people with our uh, either freedom or what they might consider some sort of an aberration. I talked to a young couple one time. He was a sophomore in college. She was a freshman. And they had been living together for about six weeks and had decided that this newfound sexual relationship, the first of each of, for each of them, was the most fantastic thing that ever happened to them. And they decided to take the money that was supposed to be for their second quarter's tuition and fly out east and tell their parents about this wonderful, beautiful thing that had happened to them. Well, when I saw them, I'd never met them before, they had been back from the east for about a week and were both in a very severe depression. And so I talked about you know, what, what were you really saying? What did you need to say? What did you say when you got there? How did this come about? The uh, father of the young man's reaction had been, um, no, no more financial support unless you break this relationship off. But it was the young woman that had came to some insight from this experience. Her mother went into an immediate, um, a screaming fit, that's the only way to describe it, calling her whore and slut and all kinds of really, really bad things. And the girl talked about this for a while, thought about it for a while, and after a couple of uh, sessions came to realize that she and her mother had had a lot of conflict for the last, ever since she could remember, for years and years, and that she had finally found a way to get back at her dominating mother. She had finally found a way to hit her where it would hurt hardest. And that she hadn't really gone out east to tell her mother about a beautiful relationship at all, because after soon that relationship was over. She'd gone out east to hit her mother over the head as hard as she could for having been hit over the head for years and years and years. So, you know, if you can accept responsibility for where you are and can do it lovingly, there will be times when you'll want to share it, but there will be no need for this kind of confrontation, which is destructive, of another's dignity or of another's feelings. Does that say anything to the question? Are you an atheist, and where does God fit in and his role for sex? I'm not an atheist. I'm a Methodist, um, which isn't saying I couldn't be an atheist. But I don't happen to be an atheist. God fits in and his role for sex. I don't see him as a little old man who wrote a role for anybody or anything. As far as my own sexual expression is concerned, as long as it is not destructive and harmful to other people, I feel that God created me with that capacity for sexual expression, and I accept it. I didn't do it, I, you know. I, didn't. I was like that when I got here. I'm responsible for how I deal with it, but not for the fact of my sexuality. Why were you relieved to find that your 14-year-old son and female guest were not sleeping together? Because, believe it or not, over 10 years, people change a great deal. And I was not prepared to handle that at that point in time. Today, I think I would be. 
and that's one of the things we try to do, is be honest and say, I can't handle that, it bugs me. Or, yeah, because I told you some of the leftover myths and some of the leftover hang-ups and attitudes that I was given as a small child, because I gave those to you when you were four or five and because that confused you, doesn't mean that I haven't learned something, that I haven't grown, that I haven't stretched, and that I can't change my mind. And, and in some ways, I feel this is a growth experience for the parent and the child. Oh, there are lots of other things why I was relieved. I didn't know her. <laughs> One of those old hang-ups we had about, you know, the children are supposed to have friends who are somehow acceptable to us. A lot, a lot of things were entering into my relief to find that. But, you know, I think now it would not be uh, such a source of anxiety. Yeah, yeah, I, I know what you're talking about, and that, that again is a merry-go-round that a family can get on, and it's one of the things that, that we had to deal with. But you've got to realize that in a family of seven people, if each, if each of them just has a special friend, they're 14. <laughs> okay, yeah. Yes, I think it's possible, and I think it's one of the things that is happening right now. And, uh, you know, I also said and feel very strongly that some of the designs for family living, I can't even imagine. I'm not even come up with yet. Um, you know, we, we are evolving. Well, Sue, we thank you very much for being here. You've given all of us lots of things to think about, and I'm sure if any of you have anything that you'd like to discuss personally with Sue, she'd stay here for a few minutes to discuss them with you. Thank you very much.